Well, it's so good to be back in my second home. Uh, this is like every time I go home to my wife, I tell her this just feels like home to me. And so a large part due to you. You make me feel very welcomed and feel very much a part of your family. So thank you. I appreciate that very much. What I would like to do, not only for those that are just joining us for the very first time, but for those that were with us at the foundation orientation class, I'd like to review, uh, because I assume that not everyone remembers everything that occurred. And so that before we launch into calling, which we'll do in just a few minutes, let's go back to where we've been. And if you would like to take your notes and go back to the foundation chapter for a second, you're welcome to do that. Uh, but we're going to eventually end up in calling and share with you a little bit more about calling. But let us go back to the beginning of where we are. And I would like to show you this, this chart. I guess it'll come up. We're having a little bit of difficulty getting that up there. Well, there you go. And this Jesus journey chart that you find at the beginning of every chapter that we have, it's the story of Jesus. And uh, we there are many different biblical models of leadership, right? There is certainly David and Nehemiah, and Moses on down the line. In the New Testament, you'll find the Apostle Paul as well. But the Old Testament is always pointing toward Jesus. And then in the New Testament, they're always pointing back to Jesus. In fact, the Apostle Paul says, follow me as I follow Jesus. And so it just makes so much sense that as we together look at leadership, Let's decide on a model worth following. And the model that we decided to settle in on is the life of Jesus. Now, those of us, and probably all of us in this room, have some type of relationship with him. Some very close, some very new. You're at different stages in your life in, in following Jesus. And, but you're all are pretty smart. And you all are in business for the most part. And you know that as much as you might love Jesus... It's hard to say, you know what, as much as I would give my life to him, to give my business to him, to give my work to him, that's a little bit far stretched because after all, he was a pastor, a rabbi, you know, and he really doesn't know the ropes, you know, of things. And frankly, if I was God and I had all the power and I knew all things, I'd be a pretty good business leader, Right? I'd know exactly when to pull the trigger on a certain deal. I'd know when exactly when to say no. I could pull the strings with all the power that I had. No, no, no. But we found out in that foundation course and that class as we reviewed together that Jesus in Philippians chapter 2 says, He sets aside all the rights and privileges of deity and He becomes like us. So that is why many disciples, the Pharisees, and different people would go up to Jesus and say, hey, tell me when this is going to happen. Or tell me when this is going to happen. And Jesus would say, only the Father knows. Well, I thought you and the Father were like the same. Yes, yes, but even though I am God, I've set aside all my rights and privileges of being God. That is why every day he would say, I only do what I see the Father. Father doing. Jesus came to model how not just to do life, but how to do leadership as well. He sets aside all the rights and privileges of knowing all things, being all powerful, and he becomes like you and me. And so we don't have to dismiss him like saying, oh, you know, he's God, he knows everything. No, no, no. He came and struggled through doing his father's business in a carpentry shop for 30 years, hanging around there, that business, he had to figure things out himself as well, how to do the leadership. And of course, he loved business leaders particularly. And we'll get into that in a while. But as we took a look last time about the foundation of Jesus, what's happening during those first 30 years and we realize that he's building a foundation of preparation that 90% of his life, 30 out of the 33 years, is in what? Quiet preparation. And remember, I tried to really stretch and challenge you to say, I know we all want promotions, but I want you to value preparation. 
I want you to see that whether it's 30 years from now or 30 days from now, and you have a deadline in 30 days, are you going to value preparation and honor God in the way that you prepare for that deadline? Or will you just at the last minute, because you're so good at what you do, I'm just going to wing it. I'm going to just kind of wing it. That God values preparation. And this is so critical to whether or not he can entrust you with promotion. It's whether or not you're willing to put in the time the effort to seek his face and say, I will prepare well. And so we realized that you can go through 30 years of quiet preparation. And then what happened with Jesus? How did he know that he's ready to take on a promotion? Well, in his case, he had a spiritual authority. For all of us, we better be either in a small group or at a church, wherever it may be, where we can bring up, hey, I'm thinking about taking this promotion. Do you think I'm ready? And for John the Baptist to say, I have prepared the way for you you're ready. For him to then say, yes, at this point, I am going to embrace the fact I'm moving out of my father's carpentry shop, and I'm going to take on full-time teaching now. And you can recall what it must be like for you to be patiently waiting for promotion in your life. It may have not been 30 years. It may have been 30 months, three years. I don't know, but you're ready. And you Get that sense that you've been quietly preparing. No one's been noticing except for your heavenly father and your earthly mother like Mary, treasuring these things in her heart. Hardly anyone notices your preparation. But you, between you and the Lord, you've been working hard, faithful, and you get the promotion. And it's that moment in time like Jesus' experience where he gets baptized. He comes up out of the water and he hears these words. And you've heard these times, just maybe a few times in your life, where you've heard the whisper of the Lord saying, I love you. I'm so pleased with you. And Jesus hears this as he comes out of the water. And it must have been an amazing moment for him to say, 30 years of quietly waiting on a promotion. I finally get it. And yet the Bible says in Mark chapter 1, that not sometime later, but immediately following the baptism, immediately, not the devil, but the spirit leads him into where? Fertile promised ground? No. The Spirit leads him into the wilderness. Now, we've all been in a wilderness. A lot of times, it wasn't because of the Spirit. It was, our, it was Satan. It was our sin, our junk, that leads us into a wilderness, and we screwed up. But there have been times in your life when you've had a wilderness And you've been as faithful as possible to God, hearing his voice, trying to obey what he does. And all of a sudden, you're in a wilderness. Why? For Jesus, it's the final phase of preparation. You know that God is pleased with you. But now he's going to take you through a wilderness. And you are this close to a promotion. And you get into a wilderness. And you get bitter rather than better. You decide, screw this. This job, I I thought I'm leaving this job. This spouse of mine, I was faithful to him or her, and look the type of wilderness we're in. Screw this relationship. I'm out of here. And you get bitter, rather than letting it make you become better. And you're this close to the promotion. And Jesus goes through this wilderness experience. And let me tell you this. Three times they say in, the, in, in that wilderness, Satan comes to him and says, if you do this, I will give this to you now. And he says, and if you do this, I'll give it to you now. The third time, and if you do this, I'm going to give it to you now. Do you think after 30 years of waiting that now is attractive? It is. Yet Jesus knew that I'm not going to get a promotion the wrong way. I'm going to get it from the Lord. And even if I have to wait another three years to wait for this, I'm going to do it. And so for you, I just want you to know at the outset that there's a model of Jesus' life and his leadership that's worth following, that's worth emulating. I've had my own wilderness experience. I remember going... And leading a church, starting a church from scratch in in a very tough area of 
of the U.S. called New Jersey, the New York metropolitan area. Very hard-nosed people, very boom, 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 boom. Got a chance to lead a number of executives to the Lord. Started discipling them for 10 years. The church is flourishing. Had brought a number of them along to the point where they're on my board, serving on my board. And we had a board meeting, and they sat down with me, and we, they said to me, you know, Steve, we think your time here at the church is over. And I thought to myself, huh, you think my time is over? I think your time is over. However, I did not say that to them. I said, would you give me three days to just really work on this and really think it through? I mean, I'm about to get fired. Now, they said, you know, let's be real about this. There is no financial improprieties. There's no moral failure at all. It's purely a philosophical thing. Steve, you want team teaching. You want a team approach. We really feel like we want more of an all-star kind of pastor, someone who's really the, 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 the pope, you know, someone who really is the guy. And we think that that's better for this area than a team approach. Well, after three days of thinking and praying through and a lot of tears, frankly, Sharon and I decided we were not going to split a church that God had founded. And we would leave quietly. But if you've ever been let go from your job, at least you can go back on Sunday to your church to get the support that you need, right? That was not our case. We made a decision that we would make career changes based on not what I'm going to do next, but who I'm going to do life with. And my parents and her parents had just moved from New Jersey to Florida, Orlando. So we said, we're going to move our family to Orlando. And I don't know what I'm going to do, but I know one thing. I'm going to be with the right who. And so I embraced the who. Now, the problem is when you go to a new city, the first question they ask you is, so what's your name? And then the next question is, so what do you do? And I didn't have an answer to what do I do? And after the, about the first month or so, frankly, I realized this is starting to grate on me. This is, I don't like, I'm realizing month by month that having a title, status, really mattered to me. I don't have an answer to, so what do you do? Oh, I'm just working, you know, hey, I live with my in-laws right now because I can't afford anything else right now. You know, I'm working just odd jobs to make ends meet. And I'm not really doing anything. And slowly but surely, month after month, month after month, I'm now in eight months of having no what am I doing? What are you doing? I realized status mattered to me. It was junk. And God was stripping me of that. And then I got the phone call. Because, you know, for eight months now, no phone's ringing. You know, I used to get phone calls all the time as a pastor, you know. Now the phone's, and the phone rang finally. It's my brother-in-law, Pat. And Pat said, Steve, I know that you've been going through such a rough time. And as you know, with, with um, your sister Susan and I, we've been going through a rough time in our marriage right now. I've noticed how well you've been handling your wilderness experience. I'm thinking to myself, I haven't been handling it too well. He says, well, it sure looks like you've been doing a great job on my side. He says, I really am struggling. And after about 20 minutes of talking with him about things, I'm realizing he's been thinking, I think, about suicide. So I said, Pat, have you been thinking about taking your life? And there's a pause. He says, yes, this morning I went down to the store and bought a shotgun. And it's, I'm laying here with the grid next to me. And I told God that I'll give, give him one more shot that I would call Steve. And if Steve answered the phone, I would not use it. So I said, Pat, listen. <laughs> um, we, we only live 30 minutes away from each other. I'm going to hang up the phone now, and I'm going to come over, and we're going to hang out today. And then we're going to start doing life together for the next number of months. Would you like to do that? Steve, would you really? I said, absolutely. And I felt like my heart started racing again. It's like I'm finally making a contribution again. I'm doing something that matters. And I drove over there. My heart is just racing. It's so good. I get over there, knock on the door, and the door pushes open. And I walk in, and there's my brother-in-law laying on the floor, 
dead. He had shot himself. And I thought the wilderness couldn't get any darker. And when you have to go and tell your sister, it just absolutely wiped me out. But I decided I'm going to hang on. And I hung on. A couple weeks later, I get a call from an organization called Life Work Leadership. They're looking for someone that has a little bit more of my background. And they said, we have 23 people that have applied for the job to lead life work, but we'd like to at least give you a shot. You know, I said, well, I, I went and got the job description, brought, brought it back to my wife, Sharon. If you were to describe your spouse in one word, here's what it would be for Sharon. Soft. My wife is just soft. I mean, when you talk to her, she feels soft. When you hug her, she feels soft. It's like everything about her is just soft. And I showed her the job description. And she looks, reads it through, and she says, so what are you going to do about it? Like, she had a little edge to her. And then she said, no, you don't have to tell me, Steve. I know what you're going to do. I said, well, tell me what I'm going to do. She said, because you are feeling so down, and out, and because you've been rejected so much, you're not going to apply for this. I said, yeah, that's exactly how I'm feeling right now. And then this woman that's so-called soft pushed that thing across to me and said, if that's not you, I want to meet the person who it is. And she pushed me just enough. I said, all right. I'm going to apply for that job. And the application process, the interview process, and the last 20 years has been so anointed by God. And I just want you to know here at the outset of life work leadership that you stand and you are here because of a wilderness experience of just hanging on I was this close to a promotion, and I got it. And you're here as a result of it. And I want you to know, leaders, wherever you are in your wilderness experience, please hang on. There are kids in your family. There are people at work. And yes, there are people that you have yet to see 20 years from now that could be greatly impacted if you would value preparation and even the final phase of preparation, and that is the wilderness. Well, for Jesus, this was an exciting time for him, actually. He got through it. He went back to John the Baptist, and we move into calling. He goes to Jesus. He goes to, he goes to John the Baptist, and John the Baptist, the Bible says in John chapter 1, and let's move right into calling. And if you turn in your workbooks to it, back to, I guess, to page 21 and 22, maybe 22 and 23, there's just a, a, two pages there on the insights on calling. And you can just write there in the columns along the way some of the notes that I'll have up here on the screen. The first thing that I want you to know is that there are three callings, and here they are. They're the preliminary, and I have three chairs up here, and we're going to talk a little bit about there. There's the preliminary calling. And then there is the primary calling. And then there is what I just call the secondary calling. But Jesus is going to make clear here at the outset, let's get clear on calling. Let's be sure that you understand what I am calling you to. It's one thing to get through a wilderness. Now it's another thing to get clear on calling. So you, you're moving in the direction that he wants you to. And so let's define it. This is what it means to, uh, by a calling. And I took, to, took this from two people that I deeply respect. Oz Guinness, the writer of that, the author of your book, and also a gentleman named Tim Keller, a pastor city. And I took two definitions of calling 
and brought it into my own. I really love this, and it really has some good thinkers behind it. It's God's summons that compels you to follow him for his purposes. First of all, let me just make clear on this. We use the word calling very loosely. Folks, it's, it's a calling is God's summons. It's not your summons. It's not your boss's summons. It's not your parents' summons. Now, he may use them, but you better become convinced that it's God's summons. This is critical. So many of us claim, hey, it's my calling. And you know what? No, no, no. It's, it's something deep within you that your little selfish bent towards stuff. You says, you know, I'm going to go ahead and do this. And then I, I start using words like, you know, this is my calling. Yeah. When do you recall God summons you to what, what you're doing now? You just need to know that. Because there's plenty of wilderness experiences, right, in your work. And the thing that often keeps you going through the wilderness experience in work, in a relationship at home, is the fact that I remember when God called me to marry her or him. I remember when God called me to this work. Because God called me here, I'm sticking here. It's important that we know it's God's something that compels you. There's this sense and you say, I just got to do this. It compels me to follow my purposes. No, to follow him for his purposes. This is a calling. And so let's break them down. Let's talk about, first of all, the preliminary calling. Now, this is found in John chapter 1. And this is the story after Jesus goes through the wilderness John the Baptist, who had baptized him 40 days previous before the wilderness, now we're after the wilderness, he comes back to John the Baptist, and John the Baptist for the last year has been discipling some guys. And people are following him. In fact, there's over a quarter of a million people over the last couple of years that have gone to see John the Baptist. The Bible says everyone in the region of Judea and Galilee were exposed, was exposed to John the Baptist, nearly a quarter of a million people. And he had a number of disciples that were following him. And, but he kept on telling them about this guy named Jesus, that one day, I am just here. He says, I'm just a voice in the wilderness. I have someone that is far greater than me. And Jesus comes walking by, and after a year of following John the Baptist and hearing these little things about Jesus... He says, John the Baptist does, there's Jesus. And guess what? It's, the Bible says that these disciples decided to leave John and start following Jesus. So what I want you to see is this, that a preliminary calling always starts with conversations that leads to curiosity. I go into my local Starbucks. As soon as you walk in the door, there's a round table of a bunch of guys. A number of years ago, I decided I'm going to step into that table and I'm going to befriend them. And I'm going to create some conversations over time that's going to lead to curiosity. See, my ideal thing is I want them to follow Jesus wholeheartedly. I want them to eventually get to chair number three. But I'm over here in chair number one, the preliminary calling. And I know that these guys don't give a rip about Jesus. i got to figure out how. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to start out with just with some conversations. I'm going to be at the table, create some conversations, and over time, create some curiosity. So that they will start asking me questions and start leading. Well, John spent a year. Jesus comes by and says, there's Jesus. And they decided we're going to follow Jesus. And Jesus looks around at these guys and says, what's up? And they said, well, my buddy John the Baptist just said that we ought to come and just check you out. And he said this. He says, well, let me just say, uh, I'll get back to that. At the very top, it says, come, he says, and see. The first calling is a calling of come and see. Come 
and check it out. So often we try to push people over to a really far commitment. And the first part of it is just like Jesus did and John the Baptist did, is to just say, come and see. Come and check me out. And you can be assured of this, that there is no calling without a caller. There is no calling without a caller. So that's why we need to be sure that it's Jesus that's calling us. After a year of investigating this, the Bible says that we go to what we call the primary calling. And they checked out Jesus, and it's a new call. It's not come and see. It's come, follow me. After a year of John the Baptist creating curiosity, these guys are so curious, they went and saw, and now they are saying, now. Jesus turns to them and says, come, follow me. It's a personal commitment. It's, a per- it's no longer curiosity. It's all about a commitment. You got to at some point push someone to say, are you ready to make a commitment to follow Jesus? Do you have your questions answered? I want to challenge you to start following him. And this, of course, happens nearly 58 times in the New Testament where he says in so many words, come, follow me. Come, follow me. And this is a primary calling. We get mixed up with this and our secondary callings, which is the next thing. This provides clarity, right? The curiosity leads to clarity. I got clarity. But the final one is this. It's the secondary calling. But we get this mixed up. Let me share with you. It's this. Come work with me. Now, let me just explain that sometimes we see this as our primary calling. Like, I ask you, so what's your calling? Well, it's to do this or to do do that. And Jesus would say, no, 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 that's your secondary calling. Your primary calling is to come, follow me. I have found so many people that have messed up their secondary callings as far as where they're working, what they're doing, because they haven't spent time focused in on the primary calling of just following Jesus day by day, being so close to Jesus that you hear that whisper, psst, psst, stay where you are, or psst, psst, I want you to leave. I want you to take a risk and leave and go over there. But psst, you're close enough to the primary calling so that you know that God has led you over to the secondary callings. And this is where I would like to spend some time because this is not just a commitment, but it's a conviction. It's a professional conviction. This is where Jesus says, one year of moving from curiosity to clarity and commitment. And now another year, Jesus literally spends another year with these guys following him. And he says, you know what? I'm not even going to talk about work right now. You're just kind of getting used to me and getting to know who I am. But there's going to come a time when I'm going to expect you, life work leaders, to step up and decide it's one thing for Jesus to have my personal life, but it's a whole other thing to trust him with my professional life. And this is where life work leadership steps into your life. And you will be challenged to say, in so many words, it's not, hey, God, come work with me. It's God saying, hey, you come and work with me. I have plans for you. Come. In other words, I'll make you fishers of men is the word that's the, the phrase that's often used. But it's an, a year after he has said, come follow me. I'd like to spend just now a few minutes just talking about this third very critical piece, even though it's a secondary calling. I think this is a place where life work leadership best suits you to better understand the calling. And if you want to just put Luke chapter 5 in your notes there, I want you to take a look at that, and I want you to spend some time 
over the next week or two, just looking at the first 11 verses. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about them right now. But here's the story. Jesus has just been in the synagogue in chapter 4. <laughs> he's been in the synagogue. What has he been doing? He's a teacher. He loves teaching. He's been teaching. And now chapter 5 of Luke opens up, and guess where he's at? He's out of the synagogue, and he's down at the business. His buddies, Peter, John, Andrew, and some other buddies, they got a business. And he goes down to the shoreline, and people are following him, and Jesus is down at the shoreline. The Bible opens up in chapter 5 by saying, you know, Jesus is teaching, a large crowd is following him, and he comes down to the shoreline. Why? Because he wants to go and hang out with the guys at the business. He loves the guys at the business. And he, he goes down there, and they keep following him. And he, the, the Bible says he's got, he is there at the shoreline, and Peter and his partners are over there washing their nets. They've had a bad day at the office. In fact, really bad. There was no profit that came in at all. No fish were catched that day, were caught that day. That's a problem. You recall those times in your business when there's been no profit for this month. It, it's red. It's not black. It's red. It's, it's an issue. No profit, that's a problem. Peter has a problem. The Bible says that he looks, Jesus does, at the boat, and he, without even asking Peter, steps into the boat you know what had happened over this past year of following Jesus? He had gotten so close with Jesus in a relationship. Peter said in so many words, hey, listen, I, I, I got some room at my office. If you ever need the boat, you ever need the office, you know, I got a boardroom, a conference room. If you ever need it for any of your little teachings and stuff, you can use it. It's like, I'll, I'll give you, you know, no problem. And you don't even have to call the secretary. It, it's yours, whenever you want. And so he steps, Jesus steps in the boat without asking permission and finishes up his teaching. And just as he's about to finish up his teaching, he says, Psst, hey, Peter, would you do me a favor? Could you just put the boat out just a little bit for me? It's like the audacity. I've given him my boardroom. I've given him my conference room. And now he's asking me to just kind of adjust things for him. Peter decides, you know what? No problem. No problem. I will do that for you. And he gets his partners, hey, would you help me push the boat out just a little bit so that Jesus can finish up his main thing of teaching. And you know, as a business person, if you're kind of giving something over to a religious organization, yeah, I feel pretty good about that. You know, that's great. That's super. You're really feeling good. And Jesus finishes his, his teaching. And the Bible says that he, the people are dismissed. And Jesus turns to Peter and says, hey, I think I, I got a plan for you. Let's go out and let's go back out on the water. Peter and his partners had just finished an entire night of fishing and caught nothing. Now he's cleaned all the nets, which takes forever. You know, when you're finishing up at work and takes forever to get things ready for the next day. He's fin cleaning up the nets, he's done. And now the so called boss. This religious guy says, trust me on this. Trust me with your business. I want you to go out now. And the Bible says that Peter obeys him. But it's the word for obey literally means, okay. It's like, I don't really believe that this is going to happen. But because the Bible literally says, because you say so. It's almost like a child saying, because you say so, mom and dad, I'll go out. I'm not really believing this, but I'll obey. And so the Bible says they cast the nets out. They went out there, and then Jesus says, drop the nets. Like, right here. And, you know, it's one thing for you to go out on the boat and kind of give your business to Jesus, and it's just between you and him. It's like, you know, but now you're asking me to drop the nets in the middle of the day, and my partners, and the Bible says a whole bunch of companions are in several different boats. This is going to be embarrassing. If I obey God, other people are going to start either laughing or really making a joke about this. And basically what Jesus is saying here at this point, do you trust me with your business? Do you trust me with your business? 
Or do the people around you matter more than my voice? Peter drops the nets. And he takes the risk of being an absolute fool. And there is so much fish that gets into the net that the nets start to break. He calls over to the other boat, come on over here, and they come over to help. And both boats are full of profit. Profit is no problem for Jesus. He knows where it is. They get back on shore, and he says, Now, leave everything behind and follow me. That word, leaving everything behind, is literally not leaving your business. It means to leave full control of your business to me. You probably have given me 10%. Maybe some of you stepped up and, hey, every, like a third of the time, I really kind of trust God on this. He says, I want to be a partner. I want to be the majority partner. The question is, how much of the business are you going to give over to me? Here's the thing that we want you to see. It's this. is that Jesus says, ah, now if you follow me, I will make you fishers of what? Men. And what do we want you to see and understand? Is this is that God understands the importance of profit in your business. He totally gets it. He wanted to demonstrate the fact that if you leave me with the thoughts on profit, I will give it to you. But here's where I want your focus to be. I want you to move your focus of your business from the profit to people. Be fishers of men. If you will put the primary focus on the people that you're serving the vendors that you're working with, with the clients that you have, with your employees. If you put the focus on people, I'll take care of the profits. This is critical. This is the main thing. He says, I want you to not just have a personal commitment to me. I want a professional conviction. I want you to trust me. This is the big time where leaders decide, I'm going to step up. I'm going to make a difference with this business, and we are going to start figuring out how to give God more of the ownership, and I'm going to start not worrying so much about the profit. Is it important? Absolutely it is. Jesus has got it. He wants me to pr focus primarily on people. And so, as a result, I want you to see this. Jesus cares so much about business leaders that he decides to spend how much of his time talking about parables in the marketplace? 87% of the time, his parables are in, at work in the marketplace. He doesn't spend 87% of his time talking about parables in the synagogue, it's, it, the parables are all about the marketplace. 93% of the miracles are not done, are not done in the synagogue, they're done in the marketplace. He knows that this is where you primarily spend your time. And when he decides, I'm going to change the world. And how am I going to do this? Am I going to get a bunch of synagogue guys to change the world? No. 100% of my team is going to come from the marketplace. There are no synagogue guys on Jesus' team. They're nothing but marketplace guys. Jesus says, this is going to be the primary way in which I'm going to make disciples throughout the world. This is the way that we're going to build leaders. We're going to have a program like Life Work Leadership that takes the focus on, yes, is church important? It's critical. You ought to be involved in your church in a deep way. But is work really the place where Jesus is going to equip you at, equip you at 
church, but then send you into work, and that's where your main focus is going to be? Absolutely. And he decides that I'm going to put my focus on the marketplace. And is your calling sacred? You better believe it's sacred. Forget this thought that the church people have this sacred, and I just had this old secular kind of calling. No. If Jesus has called you, it's sacred. I don't care whether or not you're shooting guns. I don't care if you're a plumber. I don't care if you're just working on little widgets in a factory somewhere. If God's called you there, it matters. And there's a place where you need to be salt and light. And will profit matter? Absolutely. But people matter even more. And you're going to be salt and light for them. I pray and I hope that you will embrace the primary calling so that when you hear his whispers, as you make your professional commitment to him, that you will absolutely thrive, thrive at work. May God bless you and guide you and encourage you, and I hope absolutely stimulate you to realize that your work matters to God. Let's bow for a word of prayer.